Trees have that get, threat, and reset mode, and they need to distribute their energy across those different modes. We too have our get, threat, and reset modes. Relentlessness, grit, that can have its place. But if we find ourselves being relentlessly relentless, we're going to burn out. So we have to have that capacity to to balance our energies across those three modes. All right. Welcome to the show, Ross. Great to have you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invite. Johnny and I are huge fans of acceptance commitment therapy. We integrated it into our coaching program to help our clients overcome social anxieties, fears, and that inner critic that can hold us back from building high-quality relationships in our life. I'd love to hear from you what drew you to acceptance commitment therapy and psychological flexibility. Yeah, I trained to be a clinical psychologist at the University of Glasgow back in the early noughties, showing my age here. But yeah, it was very much focused on cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, which is, of course, a highly evidence-based approach and the one that is very much endorsed by organizations like the British Psychological Society that influence the practice of professional clinical psychologists in the UK. But as I drew to the end of my training, I got interested in what are called third wave psychological interventions, which build on the cognitive behavioral traditions, but those include mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, compassion-focused therapy. And it was really through learning more about mindfulness and training actually to be a mindfulness teacher that I started to learn about acceptance and commitment therapy. I just loved the focus on the values. And at that stage, I was working in an early intervention service for young people with psychosis, so quite pronounced mental health difficulties. And it was such a lovely conversation to have with young people about what matters to you, how do you want to be in the world, which was a real shift away from the more problem-focused questions that a lot of interaction with mental health professionals tended to focus on. So I saw the value in the work and I also saw the relevance of it in my own life, right? You know, getting in touch with my own sense of purpose and my personal values and seeing difficult thoughts and difficult feelings as almost like the price of admission for trying to be true to those things that matter to me in life. So yeah, I just loved it from the outset. And I think then when I'm practicing it with clients, it comes through with so much more authenticity because I understand the application of it in my own life. Absolutely. And I think for many in our audience, they view themselves as high performers, maybe not a traditional patient of yours, but understanding the impact that we're seeing on social media and online, the rise of this thought around grit and resilience and tough it out and mental toughness. And we've had a number of guests on the show talk about the importance of those exact things can actually be detrimental to performance. And I'd love for you to unpack that for our audience, because I think many of us have fallen into that trap of viewing ourselves critically when we don't have the grit or resilience or the mental toughness to push through. Right. And that's a big motivation for me in writing the book, The Tree That Bends, that came out a couple of months ago. And yeah, I'm a frustrated sportsman. And I think I look back at my involvement in sport when I was growing up, particularly, and see that my psychology was a bit of a barrier. (laughs) I'll own that, right? My mindset maybe wasn't where it needed to be. And it's interesting to think, well, what draws you to your professional life? (laughs) So maybe I trained to be a clinical psychologist to help understand my own psychology and then to benefit others as well. But that's a real passion of mine, working with high performance individuals, whether that be business executives or elite level athletes. And yeah, I'm very much interested in this no limits and be relentless, do more to be more, suck it up kind of mentality and how problematic that potentially is. And I'm particularly interested in this concept of thriving, which is a word we use, right, in everyday language. But in sports psychology and performance psychology, it's really come to the fore in recent years. And it is defined as the ability to both perform well and feel well. Okay, so it's that idea of excel, but feel well. It's about breaking through without breaking you. 
And that really motivated me to write the book because I believe that idea of no limits needs to give way to know your limits, right? Because we all have limits, whether it's time, whether it's resource, whether it's mental fortitude, whether it's attention, there are limits and we have to work flexibly within those. And concepts like grit and to an extent mental toughness have really increased in popularity over the last couple of decades. And grit certainly has its place. But I think one of the things that grit does is that it prioritizes persistence above adaptability. So I could persistently bang my head up against a brick wall and it's not going to do my head much good and it's probably not going to do the wall that much good either. And the fact of the matter is there may well be a door in the wall that I could walk through. There could be the end of the wall that I could walk around. So I need to have the flexibility and adaptability to change up if the strategies I'm using aren't actually delivering, if they're not effective, if they're not functional in that way. So yeah, I'm quite intrigued about the role that psychological flexibility can play in this space. So Ross, how do we make sure that we find where those limits, those walls are without hindering us from actually finding them and setting up false limitations due to truths that we get from other folks? Yeah, that's a great question. And look, technology has been incredibly helpful for us. These little gadgets in our pockets can help us to stay on track and to strive to achieve better things, greater things, to optimize, which is a big word, right, that we, we hear a lot of. But I think nature is the teacher. And I was inspired to write The Tree That Bends <laughs> by looking at nature, right? And in particular, I've always been interested in trees. My father was a horticulturist, right, when I was growing up. So I was interested in how things grew and that uh, aspect of nurturing that helps to kind of foster growth. And trees, if you think about it, have to be adaptable. So they have to, in spring and summer, get into their get mode. They need to strive to obtain the energy that's available from the sunlight so that they can photosynthesize and create the fuel they need to grow. So trees have their get mode in spring and summer. Trees also need to respond to threat, whether that be storms that happen throughout the year or the risk of infestation from bugs or fungi that can kill the tree. So trees need to be sensitive to threat. Finally, trees also need to have a reset. In autumn and winter, they go through a period of dormancy where they recoup energy and get revitalized for the period of growth that comes around when spring returns. So trees have that get, threat, and reset mode, and they need to distribute their energy across those different modes. We too have our get, threat, and reset modes. So the get mode is about us striving. Yes, we have objectives. Yes, we've got goals. Yes, we've got dreams and aspirations. And it's important that we pursue those. But we also have to respond to risk, danger, whether that's real, actual, we could be in the presence of something threatening that we have to respond to, but we also have these symbolic brains that have the capacity to represent imaginary threats that are equally impactful on our day-to-day -day experience. So we have to deal with those as well. But we also need to have those reset moments, whether those are our moments or our, if they're sometimes more significant, Potentially, they seem to be counterintuitive or counterproductive, where we might step away from some of our existing commitments so that we can align again with our bigger sense of purpose and recoup energy. So, yeah, look, relentlessness, grit, that can have its, its place. But if we find ourselves being relentlessly relentless, we're going to burn out. So we have to have that capacity to, to balance our energies across those three modes. I think one of the key messages that we hear from our audience and from our 
class members is this desire to strive to get to a place where they can then thrive. So they will focus on the striving and banging their head against the wall in hopes that at a later date, there will come that moment in time to thrive. And they've even shared with us that, you know, from some of our guests who've been on, well, it's easier to say you're thriving later in your career when you've established yourself and you have successes to fall back on. But early in your career, you have to get those victories. You have to get those successes in order to feel like you've strived enough to begin thriving. So what do you say to that audience member who's, who's focused so much on striving in order to thrive later when they hear this message from you that we need to actually think about thriving under pressure? Yeah, so first off, my definition of thriving is that it does encompass those elements of the get, threat, and the reset modes. So for me, thriving is about, yeah, striving, that's the get mode, surviving, that's the threat mode, and reviving, that's the reset mode. So I get it. First of all, that's the first thing I I would say to your listeners who say that. I get it. I understand it. Look, I'm ambitious you know i like to set targets i like to pursue those targets and arguably guys i'm a recovering workaholic right i've struggled with some of those urges in the past absolutely i identify perfectionistic striving as an issue that i've had to work with so i get it and i'd listen to that i'd understand the person first i'd be interested to hear from them what it is ultimately that they're striving for, what is their sense of purpose? Because guys, we have to recognize that sometimes we get into a pattern of behaving where we end up chasing somebody else's dream, not our own, okay? So understanding their purpose, their guiding light would be a great starting point for me. But the risk is that people might fall into the trap of what are called when-then traps. So when... I have a sense that I'm established enough, then I'll be able to take an opportunity to savor it. Does that make sense? The when then traps? Yeah. And I would encourage listeners to recognize the risk that that can become a pattern that gets established. And I talk about nuts and sage, (laughs) nuts and sage. And it sounds like a recipe for stuffing you know, that you might have at Thanksgiving, but it's acronyms that stand for next unachieved thing, not, you know, and we get the, into this place of, right, okay, shelve that, I'm on to the next thing. What do I need to achieve now? And SAGE is an acronym that stands for something's always gonna entice. You gotta know that. So I would encourage people, rather than the when then dominating things, to also fall into a pattern pattern where you can now allow, now that you've had a small victory, allow yourself an opportunity to actually savor it. Like savoring those sweet moments are going to help maintain and sustain your motivation in the long term. If it's just always go, 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 if it's strive, 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 and then I'll appreciate later, people run the risk of burning out. Yeah, I, we see it often in our clients where that win never actually comes and they're left waiting for the then, but they're burned out in the process of chasing the win. Absolutely. And that's a pattern that is very consistent in the clients that I am working with and aim to support as well. That's the the transformation that I'm seeking to make to help them get into that now alloy space as well. To go along with what AJ was saying, the other thing that comes up is a lot of times for our clients, they diminish the wins, right? It's it's minimization or emotional reasoning. They just, or disqualifying the positive. They they just cut it out because they're unable to accept it for whatever not is uh, there mentally for them. So to be, being able to point that out and and let them know that it's okay to accept that. It's okay to pat yourself on the back for that incremental progress you made because that incremental progress is is going to fuel you to the next incremental process progress yeah that's exactly it and look there's this saying that we have in in english about don't rest on your laurels you know from the laurel leaves that uh, victors would have been given in ancient greece or ancient rome 
But I think we can take time to appreciate the lush green color and waxy feel of the laurel leaf without falling into the trap of resting on it, right? So there's a distinction there between taking the time to savor and appreciate so that that can sustain you and augment your motivation in the longer term as opposed to rushing on to the next big thing. And in these situations where we look around and it seems like everyone else is expressing grit and resilience, it can feel very challenging for you to put your hand up and say, oh, I need a pause or, oh, this is actually too much for me. I'm not thriving in any way. And, you know, we talk a lot about the funhouse mirror of online, social media, and how everyone is comparing themselves to highlight reels of those around us. And I think it's been really interesting in, in probably the last three, four years to see some, some top athletes at the top of their form take a pause and say, hey, I can't do this. We saw it from tennis stars, gymnasts. And I think it's shocking for people when we look at professional athletes to think about, well, they're just always on, they're always performing, they don't have the same struggles as us, but you look at them, they have off seasons, they have time away from their sport, they have to go through exactly what you talked about. So it's very challenging to unpack the social pressures and what the, the media and the narrative is to start to get to those deeper questions of purpose and values. And I found it so interesting that oftentimes when we go through these exercises with our clients, they have no concept of where to begin on finding their values or purpose. They're looking at others and saying, okay, well, I think I want what they have, or I, I think that seems important to me, or my family told me this is important. So how do we start to get deeper into ourselves to find the greater motivation and then to recognize those internal signals when it's time to take the rest and when it's time to recuperate? Lovely. A um, couple of things really to pick up there, AJ. Uh, we got to know that as we start to get close to managing our own distress and make changes and really exercise that flexibility, that that's going to be an uncomfortable process for us at times because it will feel like we're swimming against the current, right? And we got to know that as we do that, it's going to provoke discomfort in others, right? And a question I often encourage my clients to think about is when my clients are coming up against some of that resistance or incredulity from others whenever they say, I'm taking some time off, and people respond with the, what? You can't do that, are you sure? Right? Whenever that incredulity comes through i encourage my clients to think well i wonder what it is about my flexibility that is so frightening for those other people right because us exercising our flexibility may well provoke some discomfort about the fact that they're not exercising their own flexibility so it can be a lonely place and i commend people like naomi osaka simone biles uh, michael phelps who have come out and talked so eloquently and courageously about some of the challenges that they've been through and the stand that they've taken in response to that. And I don't underestimate how much of an inspiration that can potentially be for others. They've helped a lot of other people in, in their sharing. So your question about, well, how do you help people get more in touch with their purpose and some of that energy, right? the stuff that does motivate us? And for me, Purpose does a few things. Purpose vindicates. Purpose helps us make sense of some of the sacrifices that we'll have to make as we go along through life, heading towards what is important to us. I think purpose also illuminates. It helps us to understand that experiencing difficult thoughts and feelings are an inevitable part of moving towards what matters to us. So our purpose isn't diminished by challenges. Us pursuing our purpose generates challenges because that's part and parcel of the journey. And for me, purpose also motivates. It helps us through those darker times to know that there is something that matters enough for us to keep going. So purpose vindicates, illuminates, and motivates. And Simon Sinek 
and others have done great work to introduce frameworks to help people understand what purpose might be about. Um, for example, start start with why and think about, well, what is your why? And that's the purpose, right? What's your how? And that's your process. And what's your what? And that's your your product or your outcome. But in addition to that, I think we also need to think about which. And that's the tendencies that we bring to how we engage in our processes. Like Johnny, AJ, myself, we could all try to do the same thing, engage in the same process. Maybe it's a gym session, right? We all take ourselves off this afternoon and uh, go into the gym. And we've got the same routine that we have to work through, the same process. But I would argue that we'll bring different qualities, different tendencies to how we engage in those particular processes, right? Who's going to be most highly motivated? Who's going to try to have the most fun as they do that? Who's going to be most conscientious? Who's going to be kindest to themselves potentially as they do that, right? That's proclivity. That's which qualities you're going to bring to how you engage uh, with your processes. But Simon Sinek also starts to talk about finding your why. And for me, you don't find your why. It's not found, it's formed right? So what do I mean by that? Well, the kernels of it are there already in what brings vitality into our life. Like for you guys, it might well be having discussions with people like me. I'm sure you've had better discussions than you've had with me, but (laughs) right. So there's something that helps bring energy into your day through having these kind of discussions. And that maybe speaks to purpose around learning but also sharing your learning with your listeners right so purpose for those listening is there it's and it's about cultivating the opportunities to build on the things you're already doing that bring vitality in your life whether it's contributing to a charity coaching your local little league team right spending time in the great outdoors working on your physical health and fitness what is it that brings energy and vitality into your life and how can you honor that by um doing that wee bit more of it to help build it over time this is why your worldview and your confidence in who you are and and what it is that you're looking to accomplish is so important so if i have a goal or i have a i'm training myself for a fight or a race and AJ doesn't have any of those uh, as a desired result of his training, our results are going to be completely different. And I want to read a quote by George Bernard Shaw that that sets this up. And, and I think all men need to have an understanding of this, which is the reasonable man adopts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adopt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. So, how you are viewing the tasks that you have will then dictate the results. George Bernard Shaw. Yeah. A wise Irish man, (laughs) much wiser than this Irish man. (laughs) That's why I read it. I thought you'd get a kick out of that. But if our motivations aren't the same, the results are going to be different. I think that's right. And what qualities, what attributes are we bringing to how we engage in those processes, right? So, yeah, thanks for helping to draw that out, Johnny. I appreciate that. Well, I think going along with this concept of mental toughness, we have this view in our mind that we need to meet the world with force. Bending is not going to end up getting us to the goals that we want and need. And I think when we talk about mental flexibility, psychological flexibility with our clients, it oftentimes feels counterintuitive to the way they are raised and the people they look up to and the worldview that they have. And I think when we introduce this concept, it can feel challenging, like, oh, I'm I'm giving into my excuses or I'm quitting or I'm taking a break. And I know for myself and the way I was raised, 
if I was not in action, <laughs> in action was seen as a negative. So I have this constant feeling like I just have to keep doing. Even if I'm not getting the results that I want, as long as I'm doing, then I'm moving forward in, in my own mind. So I'd love for you to unpack this idea of psychological flexibility for our audience members who feel that they have to meet life with force and they have to be in action at all time because it can be a tough transition to make. But I think once you actually understand it at a deeper level, a lot of these things that we want in terms of purpose and value really click. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I, I get it. I understand the point that you're you're bringing there and the starting point that you're working from. I I think that there is this pervasive messaging about doing more to be more. So it's not who we are. It's kind of what we do. It's what are your roles and responsibilities? You know, where are you demonstrating leadership, creativity? productivity right that's a big one and i like the fact that yeah you're picking up that this is the kind of sea in which we're we're swimming and i'm really intrigued and excited about the stuff that can feel countercultural right i think if you look at some of the greatest advancements that humankind has been able to implement i think they've come from that almost countercultural space and I would say to listeners, my hunch is, because I've listened to your podcast, right? I've listened to episodes and I have a sense that those listening, for them, doing more of the tough stuff is not going to be difficult. It's doing less of it that will be, right? And I would say, and I really want people to listen to this, that being vulnerable takes more courage than being tough does so being vulnerable takes more courage than being tough does it's not easy to get out on the skinny branches it's not easy to open up and talk about the difficulties that we might be experiencing rather than being relentless i think we need to relent more what do i mean by that relent to the need for rest and recovery at times relent to the fact we are not going to get everything done relent to showing up to the difficult emotions that we're driven to try to suppress or avoid and most importantly relent to the yearning that we all have to live a life that feels purposeful and has vitality because we can get stuck in this place where and i call it the conforming zone, people talk about the comfort zone, which is similar, right? But it's, it's not really the comfort zone. It's the conforming zone. We're conforming to rigid ideas about who we are, what we're capable of, what we're not capable of. And flexibility, to come back to your point, your question, allows us to move out of that conforming zone into this transforming zone. So from conforming zone into transforming zone. Transformation is not without its challenges. If you think again about nature, metamorphosis, the caterpillar turning into the butterfly and the pupae, that's the sort of middle stage and the kind of breaking of that as the butterfly emerges into the world, right? It's a struggle at times, but it's a struggle worth undertaking. And for me, Flexibility is the ability to have difficult thoughts and feelings and still do the stuff that matters to us. Now, there's a risk that people hear flexibility and it's like, oh, that's about being amenable or agreeable or being weak or being passive. No, it's not. It's about being active, being courageous, being prepared to swim against the tide, being prepared to be vulnerable at times if it allows us to find ways of feeling well and performing well. And again, I think nature teaches us. So if we think about the anatomy of the tree that allows it to flexibly move between its get, threat, and its reset mode, well, a tree has its roots, which anchor it in, help it to be grounded in the space that it exists. 
It has its trunk that is willing to sway in the wind and willing to transport the nutrients and water to help the tree survive. It also then has its crown, which is the leaves and the branches. That's the powerhouse that allows the tree to be empowered. And I think for me, flexibility is those three elements anchored in the here and now where our lives are unfolding, willing to have difficult thoughts and feelings without holding too tightly onto them, and then empowered by our sense of purpose and our personal values to take pragmatic action that's going to allow us to progress in the direction we want to move our lives. So I have to ask the follow-up question around anchored in difficult moments, because those tend to be the ones where we, we want to be the least anchored, we want to run from, we want to avoid. And it's counterintuitive to think, okay, this is actually when I need to be more anchored in the difficult to move through it. So being anchored for me is about contacting and appreciating the breadth of our present moment experiences. So we can all be acutely aware of the difficult thoughts and feelings that we might be experiencing and how they can hook us. So for me, being anchored is about, well, connecting with the breadth of your experience. Be where your feet are, not where your head is at. So there are anchoring statements that I encourage my clients to use whenever they notice that they're getting hooked by difficult thoughts, difficult feelings. And those might be things like, be here now, be where your feet are, notice refocus. So notice if you like that you've been hooked away by those difficult thoughts and those feelings and see if you can come back to the here and now. And I think a great skill for people to develop that helps them to be anchored in the here and now is meta-awareness, the ability to notice where your attention currently sits. And the best way of doing that is to have a regular mindfulness practice so that you can get better at tracking how and where your attention does tend to move and you can come back to the breath as an anchor to the here and now. Yeah, I think when we hear and we talk about on the show meditation and mindfulness, there's again this feeling that with action there should be some immediate result or I should have some some noticeable takeaways from it. And we hear from clients who've tried meditation or mindfulness and it didn't work for me or it wasn't giving me what I wanted or I didn't feel like I was getting better at it. And Johnny and I always kind of chuckle at that because it's actually not in the practice that you're getting better. It's in those other d more difficult moments where you need to be present and anchored that all of the meditation and mindfulness practice helps you in. Exactly. There's that line, you know, don't wait until you need to jump out of the plane before sewing the parachute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, it is something that you proactively have to engage in and I like that working with uh, athletes, we can talk about the mindfulness muscle and through practice, it strengthens, right? And that that allows people to generalize what they're developing in the practice during the meditation and how that then spreads and infuses itself into how they are the rest of the day, right? So being very clear with clients about, well, the reason why I'm inviting you to try this practice is in the hope that it will then generalize into how you are during the rest of your day. So mindfulness is about helping people to be more mindful generally. So moving beyond anchored, can you unpack willing for those in our audience who aren't necessarily familiar with how to face those difficult emotions in a willing way? Yeah, great. So for me, willingness is about two things being willing to recognize that our minds are story generating machines, right? Almost like a news channel. And we know that news channels, whether it's Fox News, CNBC, CNN, BBC, will have their editorial policies, will have their particular angles that they might take. And our minds are like that too. They're prone to, to bias potentially. So the mind is this story generating machine and there are potential biases in the stories that are generated. And the second element of being willing is being willing to create space for the emotions that can show up with those stories. And let me demonstrate 
willingness, would that be okay? Have I got yeah. an opportunity here to, to talk through that? Okay, great. So if we think about the willingness to recognize that the mind is a story generating machine, there's an exercise I do with clients called the roving reporter. And I encourage clients to, if and when they're noticing they're going up inside their head, to be the reporter on the scene of their thought. So it's 5.39 here in the evening in the UK where I'm chatting to you. And I'm just noticing that my mind is giving me the story that I'm whittling on. And I might be losing the guys here, but I haven't seen their eyes glaze over just yet. So maybe we're okay. Right? Back to you in the studio. So there's something about being a reporter that you don't get dragged into the story. That's not your role. You're there to objectively report the facts. And in fact, you're also needing to be flexible enough to move on to the next story, right? Correspondents who come on to the camera every time with the same story, even though the newsreel has moved on, aren't going to fare very well. So it's yeah, reporters need to kind of let go of some of those stories so they can move on to the next one. So the roving reporter is a technique that can be helpful. It's drawing on the principles of cognitive diffusion, right? That guests may have talked about previously. Yeah. Can I can I speak about the the other technique, or would you like to to say anything? Uh, just yeah, let's let's unpack that a little more because. You know, one thing that I love about that exercise is it creates the space for you to start to recognize the patterns. So Johnny talks about this in our course. These hooks, over time, there's a pattern to the types of hooks, or if you're a reporter, the types of scenes you find yourself going to again and again. And they can create a latch that locks you in a loop that creates negative feedback, that distorts reality for you, and can keep you from finding your values and your purpose and moving forward to things that really matter. And that's why it's so important to create the space to be the roving reporter, but then to look at, okay, well, you know, how many of these scenes have I gone to and is there a pattern? Am I just constantly chasing car wrecks? Am I constantly showing up at robberies? What is going on here that when I find myself getting hooked, is there a pattern that I can start to unwind? And for me, one, one of the biggest ones, and I still struggle with it today, so I, I love sharing this with our audience because I think oftentimes when they hear us on the show or they work with us, they think, oh, since you guys have interviewed all of these experts and you've worked through this yourself, that you don't have these patterns or hooks. And for me, and I've shared this with Johnny, you know, a big part of my upbringing was around managing emotions and in, in people around me. And I felt like I got very attuned to managing expectations and, and people around me. And, and if I saw a negative signal back, then I just assumed it was because of me, something I did, some, some way that I interpret it, that I personalize it to myself. And that's a latch that's formed over time that I'm constantly finding, okay, I got to unloop that hook that's pulling me in that direction. And it recently happened to me. I, I reached out to someone for some support on something, and I didn't hear from them for months. And I was kind of beating myself up a little bit, like, oh, maybe I said something wrong when we met in person last time, or, or maybe they were viewing that story that I said in a different light, and I personalize it to myself. They don't want to help me. They don't like me. And even after studying all of this and being so focused on growing my own charisma, I found myself getting caught in that loop. And six, seven months later, I get an email from them. Sorry, so busy. Would love to help support you on this if you still need it. And it was that unhook of, oh, okay, they actually do like me. I was personalizing it again. And now I've found myself going back and looking when I'm that roving reporter, okay, am I personalizing this? Am I making this about something I did and them not liking me because of it? Are there other explanations for what I'm seeing here on the scene as I'm reporting what's going on? That's lovely. And th thank you for sharing, right? You know, I appreciate it's not easy sometimes to, to kind of open up and reflect on some of these struggles that we have. And the listeners will absolutely benefit from that really tangible example that you provided. And you're spotting the kind of editorial policy of the stories being generated by your mind. And there absolutely will be recurring themes in there. And listeners will recognize the recurring themes, whether it's about personal responsibility, whether it's about capabilities of us versus others, regret, guilt, 
right? There are, are recurring themes that can come up in that editorial policy in relation to the stories that are mind generates. The other thing ab- about that, and AJ pointed out that, yeah, though we understand these processes and we've worked through a lot of these processes ourselves, change is, is constant. So after I figured something out and, and worked through it, I'm still growing older. I'm still deteriorating here on earth. At some point, I'm going to cease to exist. That's one force alone that is driving us and and putting us into more loops. But the best part about that is if you understand the process, you know when you're caught in a loop and you and and you're like, "Oh, this is a new loop. I'm going to do my process and I'm going to get out." So now you're doing it in the moment. And if you if you practice it, it's it's automatic. But it's not to say that you've cleared the hurdle, you'll never see another one again. And that is nature is one force of many that is putting tension and pressure on us to cause more loops. Yeah. So the loops aren't going to stop. But what we can do is get better at noticing them and get better at how we choose to respond to them. And choice is important here because we we do have choices. And in life, a lot of the time what can happen is we end up choosing to move away from what matters to us because it's in the service of avoiding discomfort or upset or distress. But we end up living life small. And flexibility is about recognizing that and helping people to engage in more of those towards moves, branching out towards what matters to us so we can get that energy, that revitalization from connecting with the stuff that matters to us, even if difficult thoughts and feelings will show up. And you can guarantee they will because those loops can keep on coming. And, the, you know, there's nice analogies out there about, like, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf. And that's what I think that that's the kind of principle, John, that you're getting to. And I can certainly recognize that in my own life and the value that that brings to clients, too. I think you'll get a kick out of this because in our training, one of the core principles is choice points and recognizing that there are opportunities for you to make away moves and toward moves And we'll often find in our group coaching programs in the X Factor Accelerator that people will point out, that's a choice point. Or I had a choice point yesterday and I finally made a toward move towards my purpose, towards my values, towards what I really want out of life instead of making the away move. And that little coinage of choice point, it comes up again and again in our coaching programs. And it's so fun to watch other participants sharing, okay, I had the same one or I had a similar experience and taking note of all of those moments. And again, that's bringing that awareness to what's going on with these loops and, and recognizing when the loops can be holding you back. I think to go along with that is if you're listening to this and you're thinking, I'm not in experiencing these loops, well, you're in a loop that you're incredibly comfortable with and, and therefore you're not seeing choice points because you've submitted to that loop. <laughs> So the second willingness exercise. Yeah. Well, it just riffing off what you guys are, are saying here, emotions can get a bad rap, right? It's kind of like we label them negative, negative emotions. And that kind of creates a pretext where we should expunge them or annihilate them or get rid of them. And if only it were that easy, right? But people, I think, need to shift away a little from viewing emotions as an inconvenience to recognizing that emotions have an important function. I use the acronym TEAM, T-E-A-M, treat emotions as messengers, that they serve important functions. They're there in our evolutionary history to help us survive. And I want listeners to recognize that it's not emotions that sabotage us. It's the choices that we make in response to those emotions that can. And I think that speaks to your idea there about the away moves and towards moves. So I just wanted to bring that in. And recognizing that emotions, although they have these negative and positive connotations, oftentimes we haven't spent enough time and dedication to learning our emotional vocabulary. 
and we had a guest on recently, Carla, who was sharing the range of emotions, even the good emotions, quote unquote, or the bad emotions, quote unquote, have a range to them. And when you start to unpack, well, what's actually going on behind the anger? You know, anger has positive points and anger has negative points. And increasing your emotional vocabulary allows you to start to unpack the message that the emotion is sending in a more meaningful way. And that was very eye-opening for me, recognizing that in a lot of my communication, I would self-label emotions in a very general way, not recognizing all the different words and vocab we have for emotions, sitting with it, thinking through, okay, well, is it really anger or is it more resentment or is it more just fired up energy that's going on because of excitement that I'm mislabeling? So recognizing the importance of stretching your emotional vocabulary can actually help with the team acronym to allow you to unpack the message that that emotion is sending you. Brilliant. And yeah, people talk about emotional granularity is another way of talking about that, right? But you've articulated it much more clearly, which is helpful. So yeah, I agree. And that leads us on nicely to this idea of being willing to create space for our emotions and the technique that I describe in, in my book is um, the acronym POPLAR, P-O-P-L-A-R, POPLAR. So what does POPLAR stand for? Well, first of all, pick up that a situation or an experience has evoked a strong emotion in you. That's the first thing. It's the noticing skills, right, that we've talked about earlier in the, the pod. The O stands for the opportunity just to take a moment to observe observe the most prominent emotion that might be present it could be anger it could be right to talk to that granularity thing being raging right as a very pronounced form of anger very acute it could be frustration it could be jealousy it could be sadness so encouraging people to observe the most prominent emotion that, that is there, okay? The second P is about pinpointing the urge that you have to immediately react to the emotion that you're experiencing. So it could be sent back a strongly worded email to the email that's just made you raging, right? We can all relate to that. Don't do it, guys. Put it in your outbox or drafts. Come back to it tomorrow. Um, <laughs> personal experience but yeah you've got that pinpoint the urge to react acknowledge it recognize that it's there sit with that for a moment then the second or the the step really that i speak to after that is about locate that's the l locate where in your body you are experiencing that emotion and that's quite a, an interesting question for my clients to reflect on where is the emotion in my body because often we relate to the fact that the emotion is there and we've got that urge to react to it and we don't take a, a moment to connect with well where is it is it in your head is it in your chest is it in your tummy where is it and then after you've lived, uh, located it in your body what i do is encourage people to assign physical characteristics to that felt experience so okay if it's in your tummy if that 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 anger is in your tummy um you know tell me a little about uh, what shape it is in your tummy maybe is it like a globe or is it a globule or is it a pyramid you know people will come back with with different things in relation to that so yeah what what shape is it uh, what color is it right does the anger have a color and anger tends to go towards those ready tinges, right? Red, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I then ask, well, if that, that feeling in your tummy had a texture, what texture would it have? And it could be sticky, could be spiky, could be rough. But these are interesting questions for the client to reflect on. And then the next step, the final step, the R, is to recognize recognize that you can hold the emotion that felt physical experience of the emotion and you can choose how you respond you can choose how you respond so it's that recognizing that you have emotions emotions don't have you and you can choose how you're going to respond at the end of that practice guys i say to clients now remember the choice is yours 
you had your initial urge as to how you want to react and I've helped you sit with it, be open to it, be willing to lean into it, be curious about it. And you also have the choice of responding in a way that's more consistent with your values or your purpose, how you want to be in the world. The choice is yours. And 99% of the time, clients go with that more considered choice that's in line with their values and their purpose, having worked through those stages. But I empower them to go with what works for them. It's not my job to to really direct them on that. The choice is theirs, and I empower them to make that choice. What's fascinating about that, as as you recount the example, is so many of us are hardwired to emotion react. Yeah. And that, we see it, I experience it here in LA with road rage, just in traffic, how quickly people go to the horn and how fast the second that emotion hits you, you, you must react. And as you go through that exercise, locating in your body, giving it a color, giving it a shape, giving it a texture, you're creating the space necessary to diffuse from the emotion and to allow you to come to a place where that choice point is actually recognizable. Because so often the emotion overwhelms any ability for us to get to the choice point because we've reacted in the past to that emotion so fast that we haven't given ourselves the opportunity to find the choice point. Exactly. And it's moving from reacting to responding. I think that's the distinction here that the reaction is mindless. <laughs> it's kind of in the spare of the moment. And the responding is values based, it's purpose based. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find that to be a powerful example for our listeners. I encourage them to use. And my starting to do men's work over the last six, seven years, one of the first things that we do in, in the group share around the emotion is checking in with our body. And I find so many of us go quick to the label of the emotion, but really struggle with locating well, what is that feeling inside of you? And what does it actually look like when you say you're angry or you're furious? Is it your temples are sweating or your pulse is rising? Do you feel hot all over your body? Just the act of starting to go into your body to recognize how that emotion is showing up can be really powerful. Exactly. And it's an exposure technique. To use a technical term, what you're doing is exposing the client to the felt experience of the emotion, helping them to see that in this moment they can hold it in the next moment they can hold it, helping them to see that there are different ways of relating to their emotions. And there's learning in that. And ultimately, flexibility isn't about getting rid of difficult thoughts or difficult emotions. It's about changing the relationship we have with them so that no longer are we falling into that misconception or that misthinking that emotions have us we're starting to really appreciate that we're the context in which our thoughts and feelings uh, occur now there's one thing that I, I found really fascinating in the book that i want to share with our audience because when we talk about purpose with clients it can feel overwhelming to label a purpose to try to figure out what your purpose is and oftentimes we can feel that it's set but you write purpose isn't static it can dynamically evolve with us as our lives progress. And I'm going through that moment right now. We're expecting our first child, and now I'm, I'm seeing the shift around purpose just in how I'm looking at my career and how I'm looking at my work-life balance. But for so many of us, especially younger in our career, that idea of finding purpose or trying to label purpose can feel overwhelming and can feel very rigid. And oftentimes I think that's why we avoid trying to go deeper on purpose because we don't want to choose the wrong thing. We don't want to be imperfect in searching for our purpose. Yeah, and I write in the book about sometimes our purpose might be a little unclear and also some of the goals that might be linked to the pursuit of our purpose may be unclear. We might be in that space where we've completed a project that felt purposeful and rewarding and revitalizing and now we have to take stock to think about, well, where do I go from here? And that's really the reset mode that I mentioned earlier. And sometimes there are those momentary moves we can do that relate to, yeah, getting a sense of wonder, right? Connecting with something more vast than us. 
And that could be standing underneath a star-filled sky and appreciating how small we are relative to the universe, which is quite a, a lovely thing. And northern lights that have blessed us with their presence in Ireland. We've had some really lovely views of the northern lights that just haven't happened here locally. So it's been exciting. But also gratitude, expressing gratitude. And that could be just being grateful for the small things, whether that's a piece of art, music, smile from a stranger, just reaching out to someone who's maybe done something for us, expressing that gratitude, and also compassion, being kind to ourselves. So those momentary moves are linked to those self-transcendent emotions of wonder, gratitude, and compassion. But there are also bold moves. Bold moves are the ones that I mentioned that feel potentially counterintuitive, where we have to take time take time away to realign, to think about, well, where to now? And life changes, whether it's the start of a new job, the ending of an existing job, starting a family, and congratulations to you and your partner for the impending arrival of the little one. Um, Thank you. Yeah, that's that's an important time to think about, well, where to from now? Um, What's important now is an important question to ask in those moments but I, I speak about in the book look how are we going to be today and not knowing what it is that we we might want to do tomorrow so how are we going to be today and not knowing what we want to be tomorrow and that's where i think we can apply some of those be anchored be willing be empowered elements of psychological flexibility to help us manage some of the anxiety some of the worry the uncertainty that can show up in those moments and my experience has shown me that whenever we do that work with clients purpose becomes clearer in time and i think it's just about being patient as we we start to allow some of that clarity to come well i think that's a beautiful place to end it and i'm so thankful that you shared that with our audience because i know when we talk about purpose, it can be very challenging for those who are perfectionists and for those who haven't really wrestled with those deeper thoughts and meaning. And you can feel forced in a way that you are choosing the wrong thing and not bring compassion into it and recognizing that purpose can shift. And it's totally okay to have picked the wrong purpose early in your career and and make adjustments and tune into what really matters later. The way I speak about that in the book, AJ, that I think is important for the listener is this phrase, strong intention, light attachment, strong intention, light attachment. So be true to what it is you value. Be true to your sense of purpose when it's there, but be light in this idea that you have to be attached to one particular single way of being true to your values or being true to your purpose. There are multiple pathways and there will be times where we feel a little lost, but there are new choices that are going to come along that will allow us to reconnect. So strong intention, light attachment. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening, Ross. Appreciate all of your insights. Where can our audience find out more about you and the book? Sure. So I have my own website, www.rossgwhite.com. And there's also Strive to Thrive, which is the psychology consultancy that I founded. So that's www.strive2thrive.co.uk. I'm on Instagram and I'm on X at, at Ross G. White. And people can learn a bit more about the tree that bends, how a flexible mind can help you thrive. It's available from online retailers and will be distributed through bookshops in the U.S. in due course. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you again for stopping by. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. 